So you met Paul Mitchell in 1971 at a Miami hair show. Um, what was it about that interaction that made you guys just click? We had a friend, a mutual friend named Eva Prang, who I really respected a lot. And she would say, you got to meet Paul Mitchell. I heard of him before. He's a great hairdresser. And uh, we just met. And for some reason, we just hit it off. We had lunch together uh, in the years to come. If he was doing a beauty show and I was somewhere around, we'd say hello. About every other year, I'd go visit him in Hawaii. Nine years after I first met Paul, he was trying to come out with a product line called PM, where it was a couple of shampoos and a conditioning treatment. And uh, it just didn't go anywhere. Uh, he bought very little of it because he didn't have any money, and he overpaid for it, and the product didn't repeat on its own. When he got up there on stage to try and sell it, it would sell. He was really, really good on stage, but there was no repeat business. I said, Paul, one, the product could be a lot better, and number two, you have no business, no infrastructure, no nothing. All you've done is lost a lot of money. I said, Paul, let's do this. I know the business, the sales, the marketing, and, and a little bit about formulation but I have pals that'll help us formulate. How about we do this? Let's start a company. You own 30%, I own 30%, and we give 40% to somebody that'll invest a half a million dollars in us. We need a half a million bucks to start this company. Great idea, JP, let's do it. So we started designing the packaging and everything. I got my friends to work on formulations for me. And of course, uh, the money never came in. <laughs> so we started with $700. Well, so when all of a sudden the investor who you were planning on putting in a half a million dollars at the last minute backs out, how do you handle that? Oh, first of all, total disappointment. Paul was on an airplane over from Hawaii because he was out of money. He wanted some money too. And uh, I had just left my relationship and I had a car. I had the older car, but I had a car and uh, went down the street there, you know, to get some money. I had a few hundred bucks in my pocket, left all the money because I was making really good money at the time with my ex wife because we had a daughter together, left her the house and everything to live in at that time. So they're okay for months, right? Hey, there's half a million bucks down the street. There was nothing. <laughs> So I was like, oh, no, and then Paul arrived. Paul, the money hasn't come in yet. Well, maybe it's a day late. And uh, I was run down by a friend of mine who told me that the backer pulled out. And he said, JP, I know it's last minute. He never invested a dime in it. Last minute change. But now this is January, February 1980. Inflation in the United States, 12.5%. Unemployment, 10.5% in 80 and 81. Interest rates, if you could get a loan, prime rate was 17% and our hostages were still in Iran. Can you imagine? So the guy says, you can't really, you know, invest in the United States now. It's just, it's just not right. You're starting a company with $700 when you're expecting to have uh, half a million. You have this, yeah. you know, uh, famous hairstylist as a partner that, you know, was counting on you to deliver this investor sure. and, you know, the, the, pressure's on, obviously, but what was the lowest point? You asked me a question no one's ever asked me yet. Very good, okay? The lowest point was telling Paul when he came over and when I found out, Paul, there's no money. How much money do you have in your pocket? He says, well, I could afford an extra 350 bucks, JP. That's it. And we're starting to come, have, I left everything I did, no money, and the light came on. Wait a minute, I've been here before, but I've got a couple hundred dollars in my pocket. I've got a car. I can stay in my car for now. I'll park on Mulholland Drive. And I went to my mom and I said, Mom, can I borrow $350? Her reaction was, why? You make big money. I said, Mom, I'm doing something new. I'll tell you about it later. I'll give it to you at the end of the month. Okay. And she gave it to me. Well, little did she know at the time that, you know, so I started the company. And then I would call up the guy who had the bottles. And I'd say, instead of 100,000 bottles, can I have 10,000 bottles of sample run? Oh, sure, JP, no problem. Everybody thought we had the backer and everything because we had told them about it. Right. And all our bills were to be paid in 30 days. So right. we scrambled out there to get it going. It was low, but I bounced right out of it. What was the closest you ever came to giving up? Every week for probably two years, we should have given up because we had little to no money and could never pay our bills on time, but didn't. But was that ever actually going through your head? Like, is this worth it? Should, should I, I keep going? Or even though it was tough, you were kind of unrelenting and your commitment to driving forward? The only thought in my head, even though we couldn't pay our bills on time for almost two years, was, 
our product is so darn good. Hairdressers love it. They know a good product. We have no money for advertising and promotion, but if we could get in enough hairdressers' hands, and it was one hairdressing salon at a time, they realize how good it is, want to use it, and recommend it to their family for in-between visit use. We thought, oh my God, is that fabulous. Let's get in the hairdressers' hands as much as possible. And we told hairdressers, by gosh, we'll always stay in the professional hair care industry. So even today, if you ever find a Paul Mitchell product on a grocery store shelf or a drugstore shelf, all of it is either counterfeit or from what they call the gray black market or diversion. We don't put it there. We stay only by hairdressers. They supported us when no one believed in us. Uh, how long were you having to repeatedly tell people the checks in the mail? Oh my gosh, for two whole years. And then we got really good at it. They wouldn't believe the checks in the mail anymore because it never was in the mail, right? They wouldn't get it for days and they checked the postmark. It was like, hey, you know, I've been late before, but I'm coming. It's another day and a half, but you know I'll be there. And I would personally deliver it to them, you know. And uh, a, a lot of my time was spent just delivering checks, but most of the vendors were in L.A. And that's where I was at the time in Los Angeles.